questions or comments that folks have? Yes, sir. Um, I would offer to you that um, Apocalypto, in one respect, can fit the paradigm that you were laying out there in the sense that the movie depicts the level of rising uh, of the, again, the future of the other that it offers the base for this savior, this savior image to come. And if you're not familiar with the history, then you might have said, oh, thank goodness. But when I got to that point in the movie, I said, oh my God, now the, now the apocalypse begins. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I totally forget about that part because I, I didn't write them into this and then it came into my head. And you're right, it's the scene, if you've seen the film, it's the scene right, where the colonists are arriving their boats and all this stuff's going on. They're like, oh, are they going to come and fix everything? And if you know the history, you know, oh, great. Now it's really going to, yeah, exactly. absolutely. Now we're good. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're good. absolutely. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with the case law that's concerning minarets? You know, they're considering banning, banning yeah. minarets in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was wondering what you thought about that. I actually haven't heard about it. Uh, could you say a little bit about well, it? Well, there's, there's a, a really strong movement going through in Switzerland mm -hmm. to ban minarets from being constructed mm -hmm. on Swiss land. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a countercultural movement, I guess. Is it trying to combat a lot of the Muslim um, population yeah. um, and trying to? Is they, what um, they justify it as, um, I'd say, violent Islam, Islamism. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting because yeah. that happens, well, in terms of immigration policies as well, in places like Holland and other places where for a long time you've had uh, Muslim populations or um, just large immigrant populations from Northern Africa and other places as well as the Middle East. and. I think that it speaks to it's sort of that global aspect or phenomenon of, uh, on the one hand, xenophobia, but also racial racialization, right? Xenophobia is a fear of those who are uh, different or unknown or foreign. Um, I think all of this stuff is interesting because we think we forget ideology and how people get represented is so important, and that's why I talk about all the imagery. Because some people say, "Oh, why does that matter?" Well, the ideas are what gets translated into beliefs and then action, and so I think because we've heard so much for eight, nine, ten years about axes of evil and representations of particular communities in certain ways that President Obama, right, he had two Middle Eastern women sitting behind him at one of his speeches before he was gonna become, for this one during the election, where they, his organizers, I mean, he did it, but still, his organizers asked those women to leave, mm -hmm. right, because they were wearing the head cover. And so I think it's about that representation, right, because he didn't want to be considered you know, or they didn't want his campaign to be affiliated, right? And even though he finally said there's nothing wrong with it when people kept saying, well, and he would say, well, I'm Christian, and there's nothing wrong though, with being, you know, Muslim. Um, and so I think that it's, it's that ethnic cleansing process where we want to, um, you know, cleanse um, different things. It's really that co the conquering spirit. I mean, I think Palestine, Brian Deloria also talks a lot about Palestine and Israel in this context of saying, he makes a lot of parallels in saying it's a similar context and Native people um, really can, in a lot of ways, identify with the Palestinian um, community. And uh, there's other times where he also talks about Germany, if you want to apply the, the global context, where uh, Hitler, right, devised this plan for the Holocaust actually after the U.S. Yeah. Um, reservation system, the concentration camps were based on um, reservations. Uh, and eugenics and program. Yeah. And the race, of the science of race mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was developed in America. Mm -hmm. Also, to point out that the scarves, uh, the head coverings, mm -hmm. are illegal in French public schools right. now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Islamic girls, Muslim girls, have a choice of whether to go to school mm -hmm. or whether to uh, follow their religion, um, which is a choice that other groups never have. Not in that way. So. Other questions? I was just wondering what what are some of the things that you see around the country that are happening that people are doing on a weekly or daily daily basis to help heal this piece? Mm. Do something about it? There's lots of projects going on. I think about the work of one colleague. I've been talking about food a lot. Yesterday when I was up in Olympia, uh, we were talking about food. They have at Evergreen, uh, um, like a kitchen area and an organic farm that they have there. Um, they were saying, why don't you come back and talk about cooking? And just like, so much has been changed. So for example, in terms of Native communities, obesity didn't always exist. Um, type and diabetes, it's because farming was introduced by non, by Europeans. 
and they became, you know, um, sedentary, right? They stopped moving. They weren't um, moving around as much. And so you can see pictures of certain groups 50, 60 years ago, and they're tall then. Now they're shorter life expectancy, 45 years. Well, a colleague wants to know, there's a Native Food Waste Project, for example, and the Native Food Waste Project is actually trying to return to the foods that were actually indigenous to particular areas that tribes lived off of or communities lived off for centuries. There was never, say, for example, in California, famine or starvation until the missionaries came and destroyed some of the um, native plants and vegetation in those areas. And so there are projects to actually restore some of the native plant nurseries um, through an organization, the Cultural Conservancy, which is based in San Francisco that does some work around this. Um, there's lots of language revitalization programs, actually. Um, some, they're definitely reservation-based and school-based, but they actually are now, a lot of them are online. You can actually go to Rosetta Stone and learn Ojibwe or Chippewa language from the folks up in the um, Great Lakes area. Mm -hmm. Were you gonna add something to this? Well, part of um, what they did Food Wave also um, approaches is that part of the, the famine that was produced by, by the colonization um, part of the reservation system as a solution to that from the United States federal government was to off, was to drop you know was to drop in commodity foods. Thanks, so you get point. the sugar and the white flour and the oils and the humongous and the blocks of cheese. Yeah. Blocks of cheese. <laughs> so right. And so that and all of these introduces yeah, and that's where fry bread comes from, right? And right. that so the inter introduction of these foods that were brand new to, to indigenous people um, and milk as well, oh, so the heavy, yeah. heavy dairy oh, products, yeah. yeah. Um, really sort of it compromised the integrity of the digestive systems for, for a lot of people, and so when you introduce a new food, it's the, the same thing happened with alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they can, the Europeans have been drinking alcohol for thousands of years, right? Indians, a couple hundred, and because it was introduced at such a late stage, um, and it was given freely. And so commodity food and alcohol are two, you know, which is why there's, there is those high rates of type 2 diabetes because this, the sedentary life, not having to go and, and create the food yourself on your own land, because on the reservation lands, of course, the key to reservations is also to put it, put it on um, uh, unirrigable lands, yeah. too. So you get put on land that you can't farm on, uh, you can't... Uh, farm your foods, you can't farm or your vegetation, you can't farm your, your the animals that you're used to hunting, there's no hunting anymore, and the government is giving you commodity food, which is totally responsible for, for the obesity mm -hmm. um, in the communities now. I kind of wanted to make one last point, it's because it's something I didn't touch on it's, uh, as much, and it's really another aspect of those intersections and the visibility, and that was, how many of you remember Matthew Shepard, or know that name, Matthew Shepard? Yeah, yeah, you remember. How many of you know the name um, Fred Martinez, or heard of Fred Martinez? We don't know Fred Martinez's story, a Navajo, Dene, um, two-spirit, transgender, um, uh, young man, um, male to female, transgender, who was murdered, one of the youngest hate crime victims uh, who was murdered in Colorado. Uh, 15, 16 years old, um, who was going out in the dark of night to just kind of be himself and he was killed, but we don't hear the stories yeah. of the indigenous or the communities of color. When someone's even abducted, we have the Amber Alerts in California, or when someone from you know these different communities, we don't hear in the same way that or get that visibility of what's happening in communities. So I would just say that there are projects to work around the recovery within the um, community for Native people. And I think, though, the biggest challenge still would be that representation. So things that Professor um, Sutler Cohen's doing here, like that film festival, I think are wonderful, American Indian Film Festival, because that provides that visibility and in contemporary context so that people do understand who haven't had access to that information. Because we can do the recovery work within the, internally and if people don't have also an awareness of the um, bigger issues, then it doesn't necessarily help to support these bigger causes. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Thank you very much.